Jim Winberger, and I'm here with Pastor Roger Diaz and Dolores Lowe. I'm the music minister here at Fellowship Church, uh, had a performing career and uh, uh, a teaching career, and, uh, and work here now. Um, Roger is pastor of Fellowship Church. Uh, Dolores, Dolores works for the government. <laughs> okay, subcontract. But... Subcontract. <laughs> And so we meet weekly and we discuss all kinds of things. And I'm sure you've envisioned that we're kind of all standing around in a kitchen having a cup of coffee and, and, and chit-chatting. And we are. And that's what this is. And so uh, we're, we're going to share now with you from a video perspective. You get to see us as well as hear us, which might be a frightening experience, but <laughs> we're willing to risk it. And so you wanted to share, Pastor, tonight that you're going to talk? Yeah, w well, we started this, these programs, what, about 12 years ago? Yeah, about 12 years ago, we started doing these yeah. Voice of the Gentile Church recordings, and they were strictly audio. There were no videos involved. We've done about uh, maybe about 120, 200, 500, who knows how many programs. And for those of you that have that have been familiar that are familiar you've you've been exposed to them um this is just the same the same thing same format but now it's video like as jim was saying now you get to see our faces and boy aren't you glad well we'll be able to post graphics and things like that yeah. as well and, and so and so we keep we keep our discussions um casual i guess you can say um but at the same time we want to be pertinent and relevant especially as it relates to the Bible. Now, we're, we're teaching ministry by and large, but at the same time, we do take some considerations of political, uh, political issues, what, what concerns us, what affronts us as believers in Messiah Jesus right. today. And why, um, right? And why? And, and, and Dolores tends to do much <laughs> of the focus in that arena, but Dolores is here to, 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 give, to share her faith and her positions as well. So we're hoping this our first program that this would be a good kickoff and that we'll begin on a good foot, so to speak. And so, Dolores, before the before we began, you were talking about your experience at. We're not going to name the church, but you had a, you had an experience at one of right. these emerging churches. Now, the thing about this particular emerging church or postmodern church is that five years ago they made a decision to go right emerging yes. or postmodern in its in their nature. Before that, they were a, a, a relatively stable First Baptist Church here in Central Florida, mm -hmm. um, and they made this quantum leap over into the postmodern realm. And what was your experience when you went over? So, it's my first time being at a mega church in a while, right? And I walked in, and it was this dark, dark room with all of the trappings of your modern rock and roll concert, right? Nightclub. Nightclub. Wow. Um, flashing lights, smoke, that kind of stuff, and basically rock and roll music. Was there a dance floor with spinning <laughs> lights? <and> no. <laughs> Thank God, no. And John Travolta. <laughs> yes. And, and I found it so curious because they were talking about worship, and I was like, worship can't take place here. It's, it's impossible because you have the band up front, and they're like, it, it's just like a concert, right? You have the band. And then you have all the people who are there for church or but the you, audience. But you understand what worship is, and you've right. experienced worship. Yeah. And they haven't. And so until they do, they don't have a measuring rod. Right. And I, I find this tragic. Uh, personally, I find mm -hmm. this tragic. We've talked about this on our programs before, not at length. Now, I want to be careful. We're not here to bash Christian movements. But I feel like as Christians and those who has a voice in the community, we have a we have a we have a responsibility to address what we see as as threatening to our faith. Mm -hmm. um, and I think drawing reference to what's happening in the postmodern church, it, it's something that we should do. And what's happening in the postmodern church? Well, 
at the end of the last century, uh, the 1990s, towards the end of that decade, we had a, a, a sort of a, a paradigm shift almost in Christianity. And the idea, beca the idea became, we're not connecting to the younger people. Right. So we have to adapt, we have to change, we have to, I'm gonna use the word evolve, to where we can reach the younger people. We have to, literally, we have to act like them, dress like them, we have to dress down considerably. We have to change our our our, our complete veneer, our our whole our whole appearance has to change. Now, just think about that for a moment. How superficial was their appearance or or veneer to begin with that they can just overnight right. change, change into name. something yeah. else? But I think that there was the dynamic there that a lot of people, a lot of Christians, expected Jesus to come in the year two thousand. Absolutely. Absolutely, and and when he didn't. They said, oh, well, oh, we're in this for the long but, haul. We need yeah. to make some adjustments to continue. But think of, so I read The Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom. And in there she says a dramatic thing. How are we to live when evil is in power? And if you look around the world right now, I'm not just talking about the U.S. in general. The entire world, it seems that evil is in power and is charging on, right? So what more critical time for the church to behave like the church, like what Christ decided that she was supposed to be, right. than now, instead of rolling over and going with the culture. Mm. Uh, that's, a, that's a powerful statement, and she is known for making those types of statements. You know, Jim, you, you were partially correct. The essence of what you said was correct. And I wanna just put emphasis on this quickly. For those of you that are seeing this or hearing us for the first time, you, you, you've never heard this before, but for those of you that have been tuning into our program, you've heard this before. Now, the shift, the paradigm shift that occurred in Christianity really came as a result of the rejection of the Christianity of the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, now, who remembers 88 reasons why Jesus would come in 1988? <laughs> are, are, are we expressing how old we are? If we... <laughs> so in 1988, I was barely a believer, but I remember right, right. The, the, the turmoil, the, the uproar about Jesus coming in 1988. And there was a huge letdown yeah. following 1988. A lot of people were very, you know, eschatological back then, looking for the coming of Christ, looking for something prophetic to, to bring change, and it didn't happen. So that was a letdown. Then in 1991, there was another individual who was saying the same thing, that Jesus was going to come, I think, in 1992 or somewhere 96, there. 96, 92. And then it just didn't happen. So time, and, and by the end of that, 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 that decade, that millennia, that decade, uh, well, the, the, actually the move towards the emergent church model really began in the early 1990s. The church of the, the evangelical church of this country, Western Christianity, decided that we have to change and adapt for Generation X and all the generations mm -hmm. that will follow. And their, their attitude towards it is we have to literally adapt and be like the world, fit into the culture, become part of the culture. And they took about seven years to morph into what we know as the emergent church, the postmodern church. And then at the beginning of the, the the 2000s, they began to introduce this system. Right. And, and the, the most, I think the most damning thing that I can point to about this system, it's very corporate in its model. Yes. It's, it's, it, you get the sense that you're in a, you're in a corporation, mm -hmm. right? You've right. been around corporations, so have I. I'm not sure about you, Jim. Uh, oh, but he was in the, one of the biggest ones of all, right? Well, the public <laughs> education system. Yes, yeah. the public education. You've been out, you've been out of that corporation for, I have for a while. Yeah. Modern corporations is a whole different entity than what you're accustomed to, I think. They function in a completely different way. And in my opinion, it's demonic. I mean, I, I, it's, it's not of God, certainly not of God. But the church, after the, after the 1990s into the 2000s, the church began to adapt the corporate model. And now they fully embrace the corporate model. So what are churches, what are, what are the modern, the postmodern churches doing? Listen, they're literally going around and buying up small churches mm -hmm. and just, just right. doing what corporations do, right? right? Just in the last month, I haven't told you guys this, but just in the last month, we've received three formal, formal uh, 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 
propositions for the sale of this property. Right. Three of them, really nice, well put together propos uh, uh, um, yeah. proposals. Pro proposals. Yeah. And, and that's what they're doing. They're buying up small churches, they're functioning just like the corporate giant, and, and, and they're employing people, and they're, they, they're, they're doing everything like a corporation. It's not beneficial. It, yeah. they, 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 their attitude is, if it works in the world, it will work in the church. So perhaps it's me because I've experienced true worship right here in our church. We worship. You know it. When you are here, you know it. Right. And I felt so sad because the sermon was good. Right. It was a good sermon. It, right. I, I thought it was a bit of milk, but it was Easter, so they were probably targeting the, the people who or, only come on Christmas and Easter. It, you got it. Perspective tithers. <laughs> right. Right. But yeah. <laughs> the thing the thing that got me is even the staff that was the worship team, right? We're calling this worship. And I felt so right. sad that they just they That's didn't their know. That's SOP. That's my point. The whole thing is corporate. The yes. SOP is to relate to that musical thing as right. worship. And the thing is, is even though the sermon was good, to me, I was distracted, right? Because I was, I was thinking, oh, they think this is worship. Oh, my gosh. What if they experienced real worship? What would happen I to I mean, them? as good as the pastor was in his speaking, yeah. he condones what you're looking at there or wouldn't be there. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's just a shame. It, it is truly a shame. Mm. You know, I think a lot about when Jesus said that near the end times, the love of many would grow cold, right? And, and it seems to me that it's even though they think they're happening. trying to reach people, and even though they think that be, by becoming more like the culture and like the young people that they're trying to reach them, they're not going to reach those people. You know, there's a, there's a principle found in the book of Leviticus in the Bible that basically states the clean does not make the unclean clean, but the unclean makes the clean unclean. Yep. So if you go about as a, a religious entity and you embrace the things of the world which are unclean, you think you're doing it for the sake of somehow transforming what's in the world, but you end up being transformed. Right. 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 And and that's that's a pretty, I mean, that's a pretty obvious uh, 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 transaction, and it's happening in churches. We're seeing it today. It's very sad, and, and again, our purpose is not to necessarily, you know, <laughs> destroy what's happening in the church, but to bring light to it, and and to and to address it. Right. Yeah, just to address it. Because it's morphing into an unholy entity. Absolutely. Now, I'm being nice because I could have really gone after that and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so Sunday, at our uh, first fruits, not Easter, our first fruits celebration we had here on Sunday, as, I, as, we, as we got to the point where we did our announcements and we were prepared to, to do an offertory, I was strongly prompted to point to the reality that what's happening in the church today is that churches are going after the the, the, the postmodern model and you have these machines yep. i said and, yep. and but we're still class passing the old plate around we're still 1975 here but we want to be 1975. i also said that we're actually looking to go back in time we're not being hip at all we're actually looking to revert and go back to what the first century church was and i think that's important yeah i think that's absolutely where christianity should really look for its ground there's a ground for us as christians and that ground is not in the world it's what jesus established in that first century church mm -hmm. so that first century church what was it like how did the believers both jewish and gentile or of gentile descent how did they relate that's a critical question because lot, lots of christians me included when i first started to read the bible read about the first church the first century church mm -hmm. and how how is this different from where we are today I, 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 and most people don't see it even when they read it because they're so indoctrinated with where they've been right. all of their lives that they can't consider what it was really like i think sometimes and i i, I do hear this in messages a lot Sometimes the attitude is, well, that's the Book of Acts church. We can never be like the Book of Acts. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a preacher today, a, a pastor, he wrote a book, and he's very passionate about this book. And his position was simple, one that I've heard before. He said, God is not speaking to people directly anymore. That's Book of Acts. You know, the apostolic church had that 
privilege of hearing direct, directly from God. God's not speaking to people anymore. Uh, you have his word. If you're looking for direction in your life, go to his word. He's not going to speak to you. That's a spirit oh. of anti-anointing. Yep. Anti-baptism well, in the spirit. Absolutely. I called it. My son was with me. And I said, son, that right there is the spirit of Antichrist. Right. Uh, and for that reason. Right. So there is this idea that the church can never go back to what it was in the book of Acts. And I say, no, that's absolutely right. incorrect. You're right. I, I say we have to get back to where we were. Mm-hmm. We're not going to dress the same as the first century church. We're not going to have the same appearance. But we can function as the first century church in terms of our identity. But most importantly, we should have the same power that the first century church had. The first century church turned the world upside down, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's what was said of the believers. Well, I believe, and I've said this before, that the last century church ought to turn the world right side up. Right side up. Um, we should have that power. We should have that. And the only way we can get to that place is not to mimic the world or to, to become like the world, but to become the church that we were designed to be. Designed by whom? Well, designed by Jesus. Yes. Yep. And, and that's, that's sort of where we come from on this program. On this program, we, we, the name of the program, what is the name of the program? A Voice to the Gentile Church. We've been doing A Voice to the Gentile Church now for, for about 12 years. Now, why A Voice to the Gentile Church? What is that about? First of all, should the church be Gentile? No. What, what is it to be a Gentile? What does the word Gentile mean? mean? N- not an Israeli. Right, of the nation. Well, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's worse than that, actually. The word Gentile literally means a heathen. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it literally translates into a heathen. Not a pagan, but a heathen. So All right, a lot so of tra- Bibles translate it nations. Right. Nation, goyim. But, but it's derogatory. The goy, the goy in Hebrew, the goyim. Now, we're not heathens. And we should never see ourselves as heathens. Right. right. Why would why would I, ident- I I identify as a heathen? I identify with the word of God. I identify with Messiah Jesus and the work that He has established is my work. So why would I say I'm a Gentile? I've heard preachers defend that position that hey I'm a, I'm a Gentile. I've heard one guy literally say I'm a Gentile and I'm proud about it. It's just where does that come from? Okay, it comes from. Unfortunately, it comes from ignorance. Right. Mm-hmm. It comes from a lack of understanding. Even what Paul wrote concerning this in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, and, and Jim, maybe we can read a little we'll bit from there. Ephesians chapter 2. So, so the point to this program is to say that we are not Gentiles. And the church should never be Gentile. The church should be Israeli. Our identity should be Israeli. Now, I know that's new for many people to consider and probably even uh, affronts many people, uh, perhaps. But nevertheless, our identity should never be hedonism. Right. It should be the Word of God, and the Word of God points us to our actual identity, which is with the people of Israel. And so Paul, speaking in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 to 12, Therefore, uh, remember that you formerly the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from the Messiah, from the Christ, excluded from the commonwealth or state of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So as Gentiles in the flesh, as natural Gentiles then, they were excluded. They were not a part of what God was doing. But having come to a position now in Christ, in Messiah, you are now a part of the commonwealth of Israel. Yeshua, Jesus, is the king of Israel. Right. Uh, Whether he's acknowledged that way or not, by whomever, the point is, if the king of Israel is the source of your identity, if he is the one that has brought you into God's kingdom and purpose, then your identity is Israel and not that of a heathen. Why would you identify with a heathen? Paul, Paul makes it clear that you were formerly uh, Gentiles in the flesh. I find it like super curious that Jesus was Jewish. Jesus obeyed the law. Jesus taught us to obey the law. But the church somehow has 
divorce that. Like, Jesus is no longer Jewish. He's this other thing, right? That's how they behave. Like, and in the process of that, they lost so much. You know, they don't read the Old Testament in the right light. So, for example, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then you go to John 1. In the beginning was the light, was the word, and the word was with God, right? Right. So you, they have lost all those things that connect the Old Testament to the New. Hmm? Well, the, the, the problem is it's deep and it's profound. Is it impossible for the church to recover from where it is? Yes. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not impossible. I think. I think the the church has a has a, a road to walk, a, a path to be on in order to get in order to get to that place where we can be actually that that power church that will turn the world right side up. So we are now in in. Okay. So I believe we're in the end times, right? I may be right. I may be wrong. It doesn't matter. But we are certainly in hard times. We're, right? we're, un, we're in unparalleled times, right? To say and, the least. And what's coming down, if things continue the way they are, is going to be very hard on the church. So, what do you think is going to happen with these churches? Right? Are they going to turn and go try to go back, or are they just going to merge into whatever this thing that's coming is? Well, I think I think the the the, the, the spiritual entities that are moving behind the scenes, that are moving the church towards this place of great compromise, are clever and very effective in this in, in, in yielding deception, and that's what they're doing. The church is being set up right now, it's just a huge compromise, the church is being set up right now to go right along with the end time system, so-called antichrist system, to go right along with it. Uh, and that setup, I think, from the looks of things, is almost complete. It, from my perspective, mm -hmm. it seems like the church is a, f a sitting duck, so to speak. Uh, so we've talked enough about the church. Let's talk about what the church should be uh, from our perspective. We should not be Gentile. We should have an Israeli uh, identity. Now, let me say this as a disclaimer here. There are movements, such as the so-called Messianic movement, mm -hmm. uh, and you have different brands of the messianic movement. Messianicism in Christianity has morphed into three or four or five separate movements and their identities are all so difficult to pin down right now. Now, the messianic movement of the 1970s and early 80s and so on was, from my perspective, pure and initiated by faith, a real genuine faith and, and powerful moves of the Holy Spirit. And that, that messianic movement of the 70s and the 80s into the early 90s even was, from my, from my point of view, extremely effective and, and, and driving. Now, there's been, a, I want to say, a dilution or there's been a, a, a weakening of that movement. And, and, and what we see right now today in particular, what we see today in regards to the, the messianic movement is we have a lot of people that are wanting to be Jewish, yep. that are not Jewish, and they're, they're sort of usurping Jewishness, and somehow by usurping Jewishness, as a Christian, you're going to be a better brand of Christian. You'll be better than the, than the ones who are not usurping Jewishness. Uh, let me say this. From the standpoint of, of a believer in Messiah Yeshua, there is no real hope in being Jewish, right. necessarily, culturally Jewish. Or, you know, you wear zitzi and yarmulke, you, 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 you learn Hebrew for the sake of being accepted more so than the one who doesn't know Hebrew. Uh, those types of actions, are, from my perspective, are weak. And not only weak, but they're superficial and there should be no superficiality in us as believers. No, our identity is Israel, but our identity is not to be Jewish. Let the Jews be Jews. They're good at it. They've been doing it for a long time. They don't need our help. Let us be who we are and be more of who we are. Let them be who they are and more of who, and more of who they are. And we can progress that way. What I see in the Messianic movement today is one, ultra-legalism. Mm -hmm. where, that, where that exists, you also find people pushing to become more Jewish than Jews themselves. 
Uh, and so, and you have all sorts of other alarming, alarming movements within the context of the quote-unquote Messianic Church that's very troubling. Uh, that movement ultimately is going to completely phase out. It's already phasing out. And it's very sad. It's, 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 from my perspective, actually, it's horrifying to see this movement go in the direction that it's, that it's going. What do you think, Jim? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think much um, because I find the messianic movement of today working contrary to everything that the Lord has placed before us as a congregation to do. Oh, the church in general. And, uh, right. Yes. yes. But uh, the, the legalism absolutely completely squelches the move of the Holy Spirit. It, they may not come out and say they're anti-anointing, anti-Messiah, but they are. Yeah, I've seen it go the other way to where they want to be so Jewish that they become anti-Semitic, right? Uh, we, we've been witnessing that quite a bit. They end up making full conversion and becomes and they become enemies of the mm -hmm. cross, and, and, and it's just a it's a horrible horrible story. Now, where is the church today in terms of its actual identity? And and, and, and let's 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 use ourselves as examples. We are by far by far not the most perfect church <laughs> right <laughs> we're people <laughs> we're real people our fallen nature is well reflected in who we are we are fallen we are fallen believers and, and we are desperate for messiah jesus and without him no good can come from our lives and so we want to make that clear up front but our 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 purpose and our our passion is to reconnect with what that first century church was like Again, we don't have to dress like them, we don't have to be like them, but we want to, in terms of, of, of our, our approach, we want to we be like and them. And we want to have the faith they had. And that type of faith. We want the king in the midst of us. Yep. And we want to be led by the Holy Spirit in all that we do. Yeah. The early church, and here, here is where we can just kind of move, move on from this particular topic here. And, and a lot of what we'll talk about on this program will have to do with the reality of where the church isn't and where the church ultimately would be. The five virgins, okay, mm -hmm. we know the parable well. Five were faithful and kept their lights, their lights lit, kept their wicks trimmed, uh, their oil was, 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 was enough, and they kept watch, they kept vigil. Five were not, we know the parable. And the ones who were not, were not a part of the the feast the wedding that will come so let's talk about the five virgins that were that were diligent faithful and watchful they were watchful first of all it's rough that they're split down the middle right because it's implying that there's a 50-50 a, a split, a 50 /50 right. split yep. of those that those that are redeemed and those that are not right the 50-50 split there's a there's an <laughs> allegorical picture that we find in the book of Ruth and the allegorical, the allegorical picture is very, very obvious and clear. Naomi represents Israel redeemed. Right. right. So, so Malon, Chilion, and uh, Abimelech, and Naomi left the land of Israel. That's Israel being dispersed, 780. Malon, and Chilion, sickly and withering away. That's the experience of Israel in the diaspora. Elimelech died, and right. so yeah. who was left? Naomi. 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 And her name became Mara because right. she. Be, and this is the experience of Israel in the diaspora. She's now, better. Right. Now the time had come in the story with Ruth for her to return to the land of bread, Bethlehem. Bethlehem is allegorical of all of Israel, the land of Israel. Moab, allegorical of the nations. All right. And so the time came for Naomi to cross the Jordan at Gilgal, more than likely, with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, into the land of Israel. Now, Oprah, the other daughter-in-law, she did not. What did she do? She went Turn back, back to being a pagan. In this allegorical picture, Ruth is the church, the watchful church, the five virgins right. who kept their oils up to snuff the ones who would stand with Israel. Now, you have a 50-50 split there. You have, you have Oprah and you have Ruth. 
hope for is that part of the church that will it go is. back. It is. Right. Yeah, it is 50-50. No, I don't believe it's literally numerical. I'm just right. numerical. I'm saying that there's going to be a split. There's going to be a, 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 a very distinct polarization in the church. You'll have Ruth who will stand with Israel, who will say, your God is my God. Your people are my people. Where you go, I will go. Where you lie down, I will lie down. And that's the church that identifies with Israel. Rightly so. Now, Oprah is a church that will return back to its pagan right. tradition. That's what we see. And she today. wept and she was sorry, but she but, went back. But she went back. Yeah. So the church has to be like Ruth. Has to be in a position where the church wants to join itself to Israel. Not as the Messianics do, wants to replace Israel. We are right. Israel. Uh, or even the conventional church who says the same thing. We are here to replace Israel. No, the church has to be like Ruth, the five virgins. Now, it's interesting because the five virgins, what did they do? They kept watch. Right. You know that the ancient, the ancient word for Christians, the Book of Acts uh, uh, word for Christians, is in fact not stream. Not stream, and the word not stream literally means in the Bible, to keep watch. It's where we get the word Nazarene. Right. Well, yeah, but not stream, the word not stream is found in in the Tanakh, in, in the right. Old Testament. Right. It's not necessarily pointing to Nazareth. No, right, because the city was built long after. Well, with the with the uh with the Crusades. No. No. The the Nazareth was built with the uh with the Maccabees, the Hashmoneans. Okay. They were the ones who wanted a hilltop or a mountaintop outpost. To, to to see if ships were coming in from the Mediterranean. Okay. So the Hashmoneans were the ones who established the township of Nazareth. But it was in Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah prophesied that the Natsur, the branch, Natsur, will come. And when that the watchman sat on up in the right. tree. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So the branch in Israel is synonymous with a watchman because that's where he would sit and, and keep watch. So the point is, the early Christians were referred to as not Rim. That's our historic, actual, our historic uh, identifier, word identifier. We were not Rim. Now, it's interesting that the five virgins, they kept watch. They were vigilant. And that's what they were expected to do, to keep watch. And I think there's a play on words there that's, that's relevant. In other words, in that parable, Jesus was literally saying that the church will be watchers to keep watch, right? Mm -hmm. not stream. Uh, you see, uh, we, we, over, over the next however long we continue with these programs, we're going to touch upon many of these subjects. We're going to have fun doing it. We're going to be much more relaxed as, as than we are right now because we're doing this for the first time. So I'm putting myself in the place of someone at Ye Omega Church, right? And words like Nazrim are Mixed totally sense. alien to them. They don't understand right. it. Even the story of Ruth doesn't make sense to them the way we're They've never portrayed. seen it as an allegorical. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Never seen the value so of them. There's a lot of explaining. Never to. seeing the value <laughs> of an identity with yes. Israel right. and with the first century church. It's so, it's, it's so sad. It's like human beings break the law, so we turn around and say the law is bad and it's legalistic and it's all these just to put it out of, you know, it's. They are fighting the beauty of what the church is, right? Or well, what the church should be, yes. Yes. So, uh, listeners, viewers, we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we have much to talk about. Again, we don't we don't pose ourselves as the the absolute answer to all. The, we don't have all the answers. At, at uh, anyway. But we, we, we can, in fact, share our revelation. God has been gracious with us over the years and has provided much insight. And we're going to be sharing that with you on a weekly, hopefully on a weekly basis. Um, we'll try to be as, as challenging and as, not entertaining, but as challenging as we can be. Because we believe that the church at this time needs to be challenged. We believe that we're living in a time when there, there needs to be a word spoken to the church that will challenge the church, in fact, not to be Gentile at this time, but to identify with Israel. And we just want to read a little bit from Paul's letter here in Romans chapter 11, just to, just to identify clearly that we are to identify with Israel, apart from being the commonwealth, 
being a part of the Commonwealth of Israel, we are also a wild branch that's grafted into the rich olive tree. And the rich olive tree there that Paul refers to is clearly Israel. And so if Israel is that rich olive tree with its rich roots, then and we are a wild branch, then Paul would say, then we're going to read this here in a moment, Paul would say this way, who are we to boast ourselves against? the rich olive tree and its rich root so in romans chapter 11 11 to 16 if you can read that for us Jim. absolutely i say then they did not stumble so as to fall did they may it never be but by their transgression salvation has come to the gentiles to make them jealous now if their transgression be riches for the world and their failure be riches for the gentiles how much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen, meaning Israelis, and save some of them, for if their rejection be reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And if the first piece of dough be holy, the lump is also. And if the root be holy, the branches are also. His argument is very clear and very, very poignant. Now, this is a rebuke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a very strong rebuke. Paul is referring to these, to these believers as Gentiles. That's not a pleasant thing. Paul had already stated twice in the book of Romans before this that you're neither Jews or Gentiles. You're something completely right. different, as he would say in Ephesians. So here he's referring to them as Gentiles. It's not a favorable statement. Why is he, why is he referring, to, referring to them as Gentiles? Because they're behaving like Gentiles. Their approach to the Jewish believers and to Israel are that of Gentiles, and that's why he's using the word Gentile. But prior to this, he said clearly that you're neither Jew or Gentile or Greek. Now, let me, let me read a little bit, Jim, and I, I might just stop and, and discuss this as we go. Seven, I'm going to read 17 to 24 of chapter 11. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became a partaker with them of the rich, olive, of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches, but he, this, this is incredible but if you are arrogant remember that it is not you who supports the root but the root supports you now that's incredibly uh powerful right so uh, paul is making this, to today oh paul is making it so <laughs> clear that there's a problem in this church with gentile believers mm -hmm. or believers of gentile descent they're behaving like gentiles towards israel enemies of israel and he's warning them and rebuking them at the same time. He's saying that you can be cut off. Israel is your source. It is where your life comes from as a, as a church, not as individual believers. We know that our life comes from Messiah Jesus. But he, he's speaking here in terms of a, a body of people. Your identity is Israel. That's your part of that commonwealth, as he would say. You will say then branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. Now that rebuke and warning is appropriate for about 95% of Christianity. Even our Messianic friends. Mm -hmm. That warning is very relevant to much of Christianity today. Again, he says so clearly, do not be conceited, but fear. There's this attitude towards the Jewish people and towards Israel in general in 90% in of Christianity that, that takes a position that you're beneath us. Right. Right. We are actually the people of God and you are not. You have to, you have to get on board with what we're doing in order to be accepted by God. Paul is speaking out against that very clearly, right? For if God did not spare the natural, natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold the kindness and the severity of God to those who felt severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also 
will be cut off. Now I take the position and further on in the program, we're going to discuss this. I take the position now that much of the church is already cut off. Right. Yes. I, that's just, and Absolutely. we'll discuss this. Absolutely. We'll explore this as we go along. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, I just love those statements by Paul. Paul will go on to say concerning Israel that the gifts and the callings, the appointments are I irrevocable, irrevocable, right? So... Well, that's true for Israel, too. Yeah. The church always accepts well, that for themselves, but, but they don't hear that. Yes, but the statement is relegated to Israel. Right. right. So we're going to bring this program to a close because we're at our 40-minute limit. Oh, I think we're over it already. <laughs> um, we're going to touch on many subjects that will perhaps, again, challenge our viewers. We're going to be honest. We were talking about before the program, how should we approach this? Should we be as radical as we've always been? <laughs> and I think Dolores is correct. We should be exactly who we are. He's a radical. <laughs> we should be exactly who we are and not, not necessarily hold punches. At the same time, I want to be compassionate. I want to be careful. I don't want my purpose is not to offend people. Our purpose is not to. Right. But we want to be clear and we are going to be clear Israel is today God's people right not at the expense of the church but the church we are not God's people at the expense of Israel we have to come to terms with this that there's been a, a, a there's been a, a, a horrifying tragedy in Christianity where we've we've attempted to supersede the people of God the people of Israel well we're going to discuss this on many many programs let me say this we live in a very exciting time a time when we should be being a part of what God is doing. The, the Jewish expression or the Hebrew expression that I like is the Gadol Geola. I think we're living in that time, the time of the great redemption, the time when God is clearly restoring his people and bringing them back to their own land for his own purpose. We need to be a part of that. We need to join in what God is doing. And in these programs, we're going to put a lot of emphasis on the restoration of Israel and what God is doing today in regards to Israel. Uh, I think this is relevant for every believer and pertinent for us. As the church, as Dolores said earlier, and we've talked about many, many times, the church seems to be going in a complete wrong direction. We're pointing the way back to its our foundation, our ground. Our ground is Israel. Messiah Jesus, Messiah Yeshua is our strength, our source, but we ought to be grounded. And we're losing our ground. So this is our introduction, and we're hoping to improve on these programs as we go along. And so, then so now is the time to be uh, uh, persons who are collected together into bodies to be the bold manifestation of Jesus in wrapping up this age. Time is short. The time is short. And, lamp the, is lit. and the time is now. If, if Pastor said on Sunday, if not now, when? No, I want to make it clear that I was important from the TV program. The <laughs> <laughs> chosen, right? So right. I mean, yes. I, I mean that for people. So that's our program. And if this uh, program has raised questions in your mind, and we're sure they have, you are at liberty to share those questions with us on our website and until next week. Hello.